Well, hello everybody. My name is Pete Marzano and welcome to the Nuvasive Virtual Spine Conference. We're pleased you could join us for a discussion on restoring lumbar lordosis at L5-S1 with Dr. Paul Holman. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the control over to Dr. Holman and he'll lead our discussion. All right, well, good evening, everybody. Um, I know that uh, we're getting back into the operating room with uh, the COVID issues kind of uh, dialing down a bit, but I think um, I really wanna thank the Nuvasive team for this opportunity. I think um, talking with other surgeons around the country, I think there's gonna be a fundamental shift in the way that we do some of our education. Uh, you know, it's great to get on a plane and go to cities like Vegas and so forth, but I think these uh, virtual conferences have been uh, very well received. So um, they, they threw me uh, um, a lob here today. Usually I get to talk about something that I don't do, but L5-S1 ALIF is definitely in my wheelhouse. I think it's my go-to procedure. So uh, I really welcome the, the opportunity to talk about something that I'm passionate about. Okay, so just uh, we'll set a little bit of an agenda today. So, you know, L5-S1, it really fits into the concept of sagittal alignment. And we all know uh, how important that is. You can't go to a meeting nowadays without uh, you know, learning about sagittal balance and how it plays into both degenerative and deformity cases. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the fundamentals there with uh, pelvic incidents and um, you know, talk about some of the technical pearls that was uh, mentioned as a goal for the conference and also about indication. We'll go through, for, you know, through, through some cases as well. Okay. So why is it important to have lumbar lordosis at L5-S1? So I will, um, I'm going to start uh, with uh, Siraj, who's an intern. So we'll work our way up and uh, I will stop asking the question uh, when I hear a satisfactory answer. So Siraj, you're on, you're on the spot. So why is it important? Why are we even you know, having this talk about L5-S1 lordosis? I imagine, uh, I mean, it's it's very common, especially in in uh, the United States populations. Uh, several, uh, just the body body habitus. A lot of the patients that we have typically have a lot of their weight in the front part of their body, so a lot of them will slip forward over time. And I think it, uh, just seeing you guys do it, it seems like a good tool to have for a lot of these patients. Um, yeah. Good. All right, I'll accept that answer in the interest of time. So we'll move to the next slide. Okay, so, um, you know, I've given a lot of talks about sagittal balance, and um, uh, this is kind of the uh, old crusty slide that we would use about five years ago. So the real answer to this is that, again, 70% roughly of your lordosis should come from the bottom two segments. And, you know, day-to-day -day cases are L4-5 and L5-S1 fusions. Uh, so it's really important because L5-S1 is a foundational part of the spine, but you know, with a couple of the slides that we're going to talk about, I think the, you know, kind of the um, uh, intellectual knowledge that's coming out about sagittal balance is a little bit more sophisticated than just saying, hey, it's 70% of the lordosis. But, you know, this is kind of the old slide that we would use. And so we'll show you something better today. Okay, so for the younger guys, you know, uh, this concept of the cone of economy uh, was popularized by Jean Dubasset. And basically, when we start talking about sagittal balance, you know, none of us thinks about this, but really the human spine is an amazing machine and it's really designed to keep us upright and we want to have energy efficient posture. So anything that knocks you out of the cone of economy will uh, start a series of compensatory things uh, that can be pathologic and cause symptoms. And you've all heard of the flat back syndrome. So basically, you know, you should just understand that our spines, the, um, the bony part of the spine, the muscular attachments, all these things, even the vestibular system in the brain are all designed to keep us in this cone of economy. So as uh, uh, neurosurgeons, at least when I was training, you know, uh, the only thing I really knew about the pelvis was that that's where we got an iliac crest bone graft for, for um, ACDF, believe it or not, that was like every case. But you really need to understand the chain of correlation. So uh, the French call the, um, the pelvis the, the fifth vertebrae or the fifth portion of the spine. And it really um, sets the stage for this reciprocal relationship between the lumbar, thoracic, and cervical spine. So uh, pelvic incidence 
is a very um, you know fundamental parameter. So you have to kind of understand a little bit about this. So the thing to know about pelvic incidence is that this is a fixed parameter. So when we do all of our surgery map analysis, we're going to measure this, and this is something that's constant. It's not going to change uh, after the surgery. And basically, um, you know, there's kind of a, a mean value, but we'll talk about some of the classification system. And uh, this is basically our um, uh, way of determining uh, how much lower doses we need for this cone of economy or balanced spine. And you can see there's a mathematical formula. You know, pelvic incidence is equal to uh, sacral slope uh, plus pelvic tilt. So it's not so much uh, knowing this formula, but if you think about this, if you look at a scoliosis x-ray and you look at the sacrum and it's completely vertical, meaning that the sacral slope, the sacral end plate is parallel to the ground, you don't need to know anything else. You don't need any other calculations. You know that that is not normal. So, and you know that patient must have a high pelvic tilt. So just knowing that there's, you know, a uh, reciprocal relationship as, you know, pelvic tilt goes up, sacral slope goes down, you can look even at a lumbar x-ray that's not a scoliosis x-ray. And if you see someone with a vertical sacrum, you need to start thinking about um, a sagittal balance problem. So a uh, classification system. Uh, so there's basically four types of pelvic incidence and the thing to basically know about this is that there's a range. So someone with a pelvic incidence of 30, 35, 40 is considered to have a type one or two low pelvic incidence. So they don't need as much lumbar lordosis, where someone with a type four pelvic incidence needs a lot of lumbar lordosis for that upright posture and to stay in the cone of economy. So again, um, going through some of the other um, terminology for the young guys, uh, pelvic tilt, unlike pelvic incidence, this is uh, not a fixed parameter. Uh, this is something that's used as a compensatory mechanism. Again, there's you know a, an average range, but we're going to see that all of these numbers are really age dependent, um, and so people can use their pelvis as a way to compensate for uh, alignment problems. And so you can you can see this um, pelvic tilting phenomenon. So. As your pelvis rotates backwards, that's called pelvic retroversion. So if you've ever seen um, kind of the old man that's got the uh, high-waisted pants uh, that's kind of walking with the, you know, the, the hips forward, that's really um, a compensatory phenomenon. So a lot of those individuals have uh, uh, thoracic hyperkyphosis and they walk with the retroverted pelvis to be able to, to see um, in that you know, straight line of vision. So again, um, if you increase your pelvic tilt, you're retroverting your pelvis. So that's just a basic um, terminology to understand. So in terms of sagittal balance, uh, there's a lot of ways to look at it. The uh, terminology that's really the oldest that most people accept that's been quantified a lot is SVA. So you're basically dropping a plumb line from the C7 vertebral body. Um, in general, we um, kind of say, hey, less than five centimeters is a normal SVA. Um, these things are highly correlated with health-related quality of life measures. So all the forms that we make the patients fill out, those are actually quantified and turned into a score that um, is um, you know, subcategorized many different ways. But at C7 SVA is really the most, you know, kind of the gold standard, the thing that you know, people write about in their papers quite a bit. But we know that um, obviously the cervical spine, which you know, maybe is not something that we're going to include in most of our thoracolumbar constructs, but that's part of the um, you know, chain of correlation. So Dr. Lanky in particular has done some clinical research uh, looking at some other ways of looking at your global sagittal alignment. So one thing that I actually do like to do uh, is kind of draw on what we call the center of cranial mass. So that's really a plumb line from the external auditory meatus or the C2, uh, you know, um, dens is basically a good surrogate for that. So if you look at this uh, uh, center of cranial mass, this is actually even more highly correlated with, with the uh, health related quality of life measures than even C7 SVA. So that's a quick and dirty way of looking at your scoliosis x-rays if you drop a plumb line from C2, in general, you want that to be at or slightly behind your hip axis. So that, again, no formulas, just looking at the x-rays from across the room, that's a good trick to look at.
Okay. Um, so again, what is the relationship between pelvic incidence and lumbar lordosis? So when I was a resident, I didn't know what a scoliosis x-ray um, was. And this is uh, a very classic slide. I saw Dr. Uribe's um, virtual conference. He had the same slide. And basically what this shows you is that if you just look at a lumbar spine x-ray, these two patients have the same amount of lumbar lordosis, but obviously their global sagittal alignment is very different. And the reason why they're different is because they have different pelvic incidents. So again, even if you develop a practice in the community and you're not going to do deformity surgery, you really need to um, think about getting scoliosis x-rays to look at the patient's pelvic incidence. If you can get an x-ray of the lumbar spine and include the pelvic uh, or the femoral heads, then you know, that kind of gives you at least some of this information. But this is really um, the difference between the way I think about alignment now and when I was a uh, um, a resident. Uh, I trained at Cleveland Clinic and Izzy, uh, Izzy Lieberman started to teach me all these things and we were looking at the, you know, kind of the long cassette films, but you really have to look at the spine uh, globally to understand alignment. So again, if you look at these three things, we calculate pelvic incidence, we compare that to lumbar low doses, so that's PILL mismatch. Um, we look at SVA and we look at pelvic tilt. So these are the things that have the most significant impact on patient outcome. And Dr. Schwab and Dr. Glassman have written, you know, seminal papers on this. So, um, you know, I've been uh, uh, listening to um, uh, Virginia Lafage. She is really kind of the, the world's expert on all of this global alignment things. And so, you know, I, I showed you that crusty old slide that kind of just talked about 70%. But really now, things are getting a little bit more sophisticated. So if you look at someone that's, that's young, that doesn't have a lot of spinal um, uh, degeneration, disc degeneration, if you have a small pelvic incidence, it really is actually normal to have even up to 10 degrees more lordosis than your PI. If you kind of have a middle of the road pelvic incidence, then your lumbar lordosis and pelvic incidence tend to be pretty well matched. Um, if you have a type 4 lordosis, you have a pelvic incidence that's 60 or 70, really, um, you know, it's, it's normal to have, you know, 10 and we'll see up to 15, uh, 20 degrees of mismatch depending on your age. And obviously, uh, life is a kyphosing event. So someone that's 80 is not going to have as much lordosis and probably shouldn't stand up quite as straight as someone that's in their 20s or 30s. Um, and so these, these different um, Lord, you know, pelvic incidence types, <clears throat> it's, it's important to know, and this fits in with our L5S1 concept, as you go from a type 1 to a type 4 pelvic incidence, the um, apex of your lord lordosis changes. So if you have someone that has had a previous fusion that has a flat back syndrome, and you're going to choose uh, PSO for correction, or maybe you have someone with a Harrington fusion. Typically, those patients are not fused at four, five, and five, one, but they have a flat back. And you're going to say, okay, am I going to do a hyperlordotic L5S1 inner body, or am I going to do a PSO? Understanding where the normal apex of the lordosis is is important because it's important to plan and choose the area of the spine to place your correction because. If you give someone too much lordosis in the upper part of their lumbar spine, for example, we know now that um, that can be a risk factor for things like PJK. So again, um, this is kind of looking at some more recent publications and looking at um, the amount of lordosis uh, based on uh, high and low pelvic incidence. So interestingly enough, if you look at this slide, it turns out that most people actually have about 35 degrees of lordosis from L4 to S1. And that really, when you look at the difference between a low pelvic incidence and a high pelvic incidence, that extra lordosis that you would have with a type four pelvic incidence is actually from L1 to L4. So I think this is some newer data, you know, that uh, Dr. Schwab and uh, Dr. Glassman and others have brought to light. And of course, Dr. Lafage, so if you're running primarily a degenerative practice, this is good practical information because 
you know, obviously that doesn't mean that if you do a two level fusion, you have to put a 20 degree and a 15 degree implant because some of the lordosis is built into the shape of the vertebral bodies. But again, if you don't get scoliosis x-rays and you're going to do a two level fusion, if you remember, hey, in most people, you know, regardless of their pelvic incidence, they're going to have about 30, uh, 35 degrees of lordosis. This is, is very uh, useful information to know. And again, um, uh, this is a slide uh, from uh, Virginia Lafage, but this kind of just reminds us that there is uh, age adjusted alignment that needs to be taken into consideration. If you look at um, your global alignment and PILL mismatch, as you go from your 30s to your 60s and 70s, again, it is normal to have a higher mismatch. So um, the Surgy map and all the other free software that you can use. Um, you punch in the age and you'll see those parameters change as you um, move the patient's age from, you know, 30 to 70. Um, um, this, this was actually an interesting uh, paper looking at age and spinal alignment. So, you know, it's, you, you run a fine line because we know if you undercorrect people, they're going to have a worse outcome. That's something that we've all thought for many years. And so you can see these are looking at some data for patients that had a, a low Oswestry disability score of 20 and a high score of 40, if they overcorrected people for their age, there, there was no clinical benefit to that. And all that did was really increase the risk for PJK. So again, I, you know, when I start looking at my 70 and 75 year old patients, I'm, I'm looking more again for that C2 or uh, center of cranial mass. And with my simulations, I'm really trying to put that over or slightly behind the femoral heads and not even worrying so much about saying, hey, the, the, the PILL mismatch has to be you know, less than 10 or your SVA has to be less than five because that might not be the best thing for the patient, uh, particularly if they're older. Okay, so um, what is the difference between a degenerative and a deformity case? I think that um, saying that we're doing a degenerative case so we don't need to think about these things or we're doing a deformity case so we hopefully are paying attention. You know, I, I think everyone would agree now that we really have to kind of drop those artificial uh, labels because I can tell you uh, there's one famous patient at Houston Methodist um, that started off, um, I've seen the films, virginal patient, never had surgery before, bad L4-5 T lift, the last operation was a C2 to the pelvis. So um, that, that case turned from a degenerative case to a nightmare deformity case. So again, I think it's just important that we, you know, especially when we start talking about how important L5S1 is, that's every case. It's not if you're, you know, just doing a scoliosis operation. So uh, I think this was brought up. So where do we use the ALIF? Well, this is really a versatile operation. Uh, again, it's my go-to operation. There are certain, you know, patients that maybe are not good candidates. We'll touch on that, but you can use this for degenerative cases. People like basically the Tiger Woods syndrome, multiple discectomies, recurrent herniations, mechanical back pain. Obviously, we see a lot of patients with spondylolysis, and in my practice and others on the call, uh, degenerative scoliosis. Even in patients that you're going to do um, multi-level um, you know, fusions on for trauma, you need to start thinking about these things because you, know, you can fix someone's fracture and if you kind of set them up for failure by not thinking about lordosis, contouring your rods appropriately depending on where the fracture is, you can basically be dooming them uh, for another surgery. Okay, so this is just uh, an example. Again, is this a degenerative case? This uh, gentleman uh, had an L4-5 decompression. You can see he's got uh, a decompression, all the ligament flavum is gone, but he's got a spondylolysis actually at L4-5. So you can see terrible foraminal stenosis. So he presented with mechanical back pain and radiculopathy. And you know, both foramen are tight. So again, this is just his surgery map analysis. So you can see I've drawn in that C2 plumb line. And you know, this uh, gentleman was pretty young. I think he's in his um, late 40s, early 50s. So you can see that um, the pelvic uh, tilt is orange. So on surgery map, anything that's green means you're within the normal range for your age. Anything that's orange is borderline. Anything that's red is obviously abnormal. 
So you can see that um, he already is developing a bit of a high pelvic tilt. I mean, he's got reasonably good global alignment, but he's really not quite where he should be. And so if you kind of correct for his pelvic tilt a little bit, he'll be a little bit more forward. So I did a, you know, an X lift on him and you know, he did great. So you can see that was a 15 degree cage, solid fusion. And so now you can see his scoliosis X-ray. So um, again, all those uh, parameters are now in the green uh, zone. So is this like a huge uh, difference? No, but you know, I think if you start looking at this, if you do a bad job with a T lift, or when I was a resident, this was a posterior lateral fusion, 100%. We tried to pull the spondy back a little bit with the screws. Uh, do a great decompression and basically fuse the pa uh, patient with the same segmental lordosis. So you can see just, you know, paying attention to this and making uh, small changes in segmental alignment uh, can set people up for long-term success. So I think um, for all the young guys out there, this, this is probably the paper that most people will talk about, um, you know, looking at what happens to people when they have um, you know, degenerative cases, and they get some type of uh, a poorly done lumbar fusion, you know, are they more likely to develop adjacent segment disease? So you can look at this paper, and you can see the number of cases that were done at each level. So it turns out that basically, if you do a degenerative fusion, and you don't match pelvic incidence to lumbar lordosis, this study shows that you're increasing the patient's risk for adjacent segment disease requiring surgery by 10 times. So, you know, I think there's justification on our patient's part to ask the question in clinic, hey, I heard if you get a fusion, you're just setting yourself up for the next one. And the truth of the matter is that, you know, no matter how good of a job you do with surgery, you could do everything right, you can do a perfect operation, every day that you're alive doing normal things, your spine's gonna break down a little bit. So you know, you can't stop the degenerative process, but we can do as much as we can do to not, you know, set people up for failure. I mean, if someone gets a fusion and then they come back 10 or 15 years later and they need another surgery, you know, I, as a surgeon, I feel okay about that. If they come back two or three years after the index procedure, then, you know, I think we did something wrong. So, you know, you guys really need to, to understand this. So, um, Inner body fusion, amazingly, uh, the young guys might not know this, uh, our institution at Methodist, we uh, are very uh, x um, uh, centric if you will, uh, for others, other levels other than uh, L5-S1, obviously. But if you look around the country, t lift is still the most common inner body uh, fusion operation that's performed. But, okay, so I went to the University of Michigan. So my job now for the rest of this talk is to convince you that t lift is the little brother. So uh, Mike Hart was a running back. He called Michigan State the little brother. And I think for the next eight to 10 years, Michigan, you know, took it in the chin uh, during the D'Antoni years. But Harbaugh came back to Michigan, order's been restored, and we know that t lift just like the Spartans, is the little brother. And so I will convince you of that in the next 25 to 30 minutes. So why, is, why does L5S1 ALIF wear the belt? Why is it the champion? Um, I think there's lots of papers uh, that would suggest that if you look at people that have degenerative disc disease, uh, this is probably the best operation that we can do for mechanical back pain. There's different theoretical reasons for that, but you remove the most disc, you remove some of those nociceptive fibers in the posterior annulus, um, obviously, the surface area for fusion is great with an A-lift compared to a T-lift. You're getting a much bigger Cajun, um, indirect foraminal uh, restoration. Obviously, we, we know this with our X-lift experience, but um, this was something that we've known for years with A-lift. Um, you know, the, the classic orthopedic training is that if you do an L5-S1 A-lift for someone that has radiculopathy and spondylolysis, you really don't need to do a direct decompression. You get all of the improvement in, in leg pain with indirect uh, restoration. And obviously we're gonna talk about segmental lordosis and global and sagittal alignments. Um, so again, this was an interesting study kind of looking at this and um, you guys should look at this paper. 
and they kind of came up with a protocol to look at the, the uh, frame and radiographically. And so if you look at this, there's, you know, if you look at the frame and there's really foraminal width, which is front to back and the foraminal height, uh, which is from pedicle to pedicle and then the area. So if you look at this, um, you know, this is kind of looking at um, a lift surgery, um, 66, 21%, 30% increase in all these parameters. Um, and you can see that if you look at L5S1 compared to other levels, the impact and the change in the foraminal anatomy, it's most pronounced at L5S1. Um, this was a paper that, um, you know, this is 2007, so it's a little bit of an older paper, but it's still uh, very commonly cited. So this is looking at ALIF uh, versus TLIF. Uh, the guys at Northwestern, Dr. Uh, Andra did this study. So if you look at this, um, if you look at the change in foraminal height, um, 2.7 millimeter increase with a 5.1 A-lift, actually um, smaller foraminal height with a T-lift, a huge um, increase in uh, the percentage. Again, if you look at it overall, the percent increase. Um, change in the Cobb angle, you know, 8.3 degrees. And you can see, you know, when people say that a T-lift can be a kyphosing operation, this is the data that they're looking at. Same thing here. So this is change in lumbar lordosis. So again, 6.2 degrees might not be what you would think with you know, some of these larger A-lift cages. Probably in 2007, uh, you were looking more at like machine allograft and maybe a more limited set of peak spacers. We obviously have a, a bigger library and choice of lordosis nowadays. But again, 6.2 versus negative 2.1. So again, this data really shows you um, you know, that in general, if you do a T-lift, you're really not getting a lot of lordosis and you may actually be flattening the patient. Same thing as we looked at uh, previously, if you look at all this stuff and you parse out the levels, L5S1, it really has the most dramatic impact. Uh, this was, uh, obviously everyone knows uh, Dr. Lanky, um, and you know, this is some of his data here. Uh, I think actually Dr. Lanky has shifted uh, to doing more T lifts and A lifts, and I haven't personally asked him his reason for that. But again, if you look at the global alignment, you know you still see um, a better statistical improvement with A lift. Uh, if you look at that slide on the right, there's a suggestion there that some of the fractional curve improvement might be better with T lift. But uh, the one thing that uh, I actually learned looking at this paper and talking uh, with um, uh, some of his fellows is. When he does his a lifts for deformity, he actually sometimes, maybe up to 80% of the time, will do the a lift after the posterior. So obviously, if you've already locked in your correction with the screws, you're not going to have as much of a, an impact by doing an a lift after you've already done posterior instrumentation. Okay, so before we get into some uh, cases and tips and tricks, that's just a quick literature review, some basic stuff. Who's got questions? Fire, fire away. Dr. Tolman, it's Hussein. I got a question about, um, uh, so if you're doing like, if you do, when you do hyperlordotics at 5.1, even let's say at 4.5 as well, do you worry about stretching the vasculature because you're like, as opposed to like a PSO or something where you're closing down space and in the setting of, of, of putting hyperlordotics in, especially down there, do you worry about stretching the vessels too much? If you, let's say, and let's say you're really trying to, like, I got a guy coming up who's got like a 55 degree mismatch. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I'm considering doing a 5.1 A-lift, maybe even a 5.1, a 4.5 uh, A-lift as well, and then doing hyperlordotics, or at least doing laterals, and maybe hyperlordotics at uh, um, higher up in the lumbar spine through X-lifts. But it, do you worry about stretching the vessels when you do that? Um, generally, that's not something, I mean, obviously, uh, there's, you know, some concern when you do kind of the classic Smith-Peterson osteotomy, where you get osteoclasis through the anterior column. Uh, but no, that really hasn't been, you know, a big concern of mine. Um, you know, you're lengthening the anterior column a little bit, shortening the posterior column. I mean, I think, um, you know, the, the younger residents, obviously the, the biggest thing about the vessels is making sure that you look at, you know, the, the specifics of position. We'll talk about that, but probably the biggest thing is just calcification. So manipulating um, the vessels, particularly at four or five, where you have to do a lot more vascular mobilization. If someone has calcification, um, you know, their, their vascular paths, you, you know, particularly at L45, I've gone away from doing A-lifts 
and kind of transition more to doing laterals just for that reason. But no, I don't think that I've really seen a big problem with um, any type of you know, thrombosis or injury from lengthening the anterior column during these types of operations. It's a good question. Anyone else? Good, okay. Why don't we uh, keep moving along? Okay, so uh, technical pearls. Um, <clears throat> obviously, um, you know, surgery starts um, in the clinic and with your preoperative planning. So um, we are, uh, all the guys that have trained at Methodist, we've got Dr. Reardon, he's an amazing vascular surgeon. And obviously um, most people that do ALF surgery have identified that person that's uh, facile, quick. Um, you know, if you get a good exposure surgeon, I mean, it could be, you know, five you know, to 10 minutes at the most to get a good exposure. At L5S1, which is what we're focused on today, obviously we're typically working in the bifurcation so you're really not uh, worried too much about mobilizing the vessels. But if you have someone with some calcification, you want to do a 5-1 A-lift, you want to make sure that they don't have a really low bifurcation. So if the bifurcation is low and it's plastered over the disc space and they have vascular disease, that would be a case where preoperatively you're going to you know, understand that, hey, this is maybe not the best idea. Um, obviously, there's a lot of talk now about doing 5-1 in the lateral position. Uh, Pete, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we might be getting that in one of the, the later um, virtual conferences. Uh, but, um, you know, you want to look at your left common iliac vein. If uh, that is uh, really welded to the front of the spine, if the vessels are a little bit more medial, then obviously um, doing it from the lateral position where you really have to, in my opinion, move the left common iliac vein a little bit more might not be the best idea, but you kind of look for that, um, that fat stripe underneath the vein. Um, and, um, you know, again, it's just uh, having that experienced vascular surgeon that makes all the difference in the world. I mean, I've looked at you know, studies and said, well, you know, I think the vessels are kind of all over the disc base. And, you know, six minutes later, you could drive a truck through the exposure. So the vessels can move. Um, I think CT scan, obviously, we don't want to radiate our patients more than we need to. But when you start doing uh, particularly deformity cases, I'm doing more and more CTs. Again, you can look at calcification, but you can see that on an x-ray, but we're really looking for that air vacuum phenomenon. If I want to really get a lot of correction, if I see, you know, gas in the disc, then I know I'm going to get, you know, that 15 degree, 20 degree, 30 degree implant. So air vacuum phenomenon in CT is something that you want to see if you really need to push uh, the lordosis. And then of course, you don't want to make a mistake and try to do an operation like this if you've got ankylosed or really uh, degenerated facet joints. Uh, there are patients where if they have, you know, really, really locked in facets, um, maybe you're going to have to do a little bit of a release before, you know, trying to put in a really, really lordotic cage. If you're doing, you know, a 12 or 15 degree cage and the, the facets are degenerated and a little bit stiff, you know, you can probably get away with that. But if you're going to try to really do a hyperlordotic cage and they have a lot of spondylosis, you might want to consider doing a back front back. DEXA scan, obviously, um, you know, you don't want to do any of these operations in people that have terrible bone. There's no excuse uh, for not getting a bone density test. Uh, Forteo and Timlos, powerful medications. Um, you can treat these patients for three months, six months. Uh, if I have someone that needs a scoli operation that has terrible bone, we'll treat them for a year. So you can fix those controllable variables. And obviously, we talked about the, the x-rays. So you really need to get um, some semblance of pelvic incidence. So whether you get a scoliosis x-ray, which is probably what everyone should do, or, you know, you get um, a lumbar film that shows you the femoral heads, you need to know, you know, what the pelvic incidence is. Um, looking at uh, flexion extension x-rays and right and left side bending can show you passive correction. And um, also, you know, we'll talk a little bit about how the 5-1 A-lift is very powerful in, in correcting a coronal deformity as well. Um, so a couple things about uh, the setup in the OR. Obviously, if you want to push the lower doses, uh, we tend to put a little bump under the sacrum, particularly if you have a very lordotic disc space. 
it can be difficult to kind of see down the barrel of the disc and see the PLL if you're trying uh, to release that to, to get a lot of correction. So putting a bump underneath the sacrum um, is helpful and we'll show a couple pictures there. Um, I personally treat my A-lifts uh, at L5-S1 like a lateral. I think we've learned that um, X-lift is a very fluoroscopy-driven procedure. And in my opinion, A-lift, uh, particularly for hyperlordotic, is the same way. So I use a lot of fluoro uh, to respect the end plates, uh, really see that we're getting inver intervertebral distraction, we're not deforming the end plates. And so we have a particular way of wrapping the arm so that you can move your C-arm up and down efficiently. And uh, obviously, uh, we need to be, you know, uh, cognizant of the, the uh, possibility of vascular problems. We've had a, a few people with vascular thrombosis. So you could put a pulse ox on the great toe, and that can potentially alert you to any type of flow problems as they're happening real time. And then obviously, there's different exposures. So we tend to just use Steinman pins. So we'll just go through this quickly. You can see there's the bump under the sacrum. We hyperextend the uh, bed a little bit, kind of try to get that break in, at the crest over the break in the bed. And then you can see this is just us wrapping the arm. So as opposed to having the, you know, the arms out uh, at the side on arm boards, which obviously is not very favorable for you kind of moving the C-arm up and out of your way. So you can drape it in the field. We kind of wrap the arms like this and uh, you just got to make sure your IVs are working. The anesthesiologists don't mind. This is just uh, kind of showing you that you can move up and down around the patient. Um, when we do this wrapping, we, we like to get the arms so that you can see a little bit above the umbilicus. If something terrible happens, you get a terrible vascular injury, you need to have enough room with your exposure to cut the patient bigger and get a big ex exposure so that you can see what's, what's happening. So you don't want to kind of limit how much you can extend your incision. So we tend to get those arms wrapped up above the umbilicus. And then this is, uh, again, just our kind of cone of Steinman pins. So we really get a nice extensile exposure. There's obviously different retractor systems that are great, but we kind of do it old school with the Steinman pins. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Um, you know, just to say that, um, you know, if you have someone with a really collapsed disc, then obviously there's not as much um, disc to remove. But if you're doing a 5-1 ALF on someone that has a tall disc, the, the trick where you um, cut the annulus and get your cob in that um, plane between the bony and cartilaginous end plate. So you try to lift off the disc in one piece. It, it can make the discectomy a lot more efficient. So that's a, a good trick to get uh, to, to know. And then obviously when you do hyperlordotic um, cases, you really do need to release the PLL. So we tend to use the uh, small curb curette and again, under fluoro, make sure we get that behind the vertebral body of L5. It's really no different than doing um, an ACDF. It's just, we kind of call it an ACDF in the lumbar spine. So we use our kerosens to remove that posterior disc uh, to make sure we're not pushing anything into the frame. And, um, and then one of the technical pearls that we do is if you need to really mobilize the segment, distract it, we use our paddle distractors. We try to get a wide discectomy get those paddles on the ring apophysis on the hardest bone. So if someone does have kind of marginal bone, you don't want to try putting in your distraction paddles in the middle of the disc space because you're obviously more prone to kind of blowing through the end plates. So moving those uh, side to side on the most lateral part of the disc is very helpful. And then what we'll do is put one in on one side, leave it in place, and then work on the other side and kind of move those back and forth. And this is uh, just a kind of an example, you know, we, we really get those paddles a little bit into the epidural space uh, to mobilize the, the back of the disc space to get um, those bigger um, lordotic implants in. And this is just kind of showing you moving things side to side. Um, we do tend to uh, get one AP just to kind of make sure that we're um, in the middle of the disc space. If you're doing a scoliosis case and there's a fractional curve, uh, depending on the you know, the, uh, the side that um, has the fractional curve. Sometimes you'll want to put your implant in asymmetric, uh, you know, kind of like you would do for an asymmetric key lift. So in general, for most cases, you want it in the middle. Uh, so we do tend to just, once we get the trial and the lateral that we like, at least checking one AP. Okay, and so again, in terms of putting in screws, uh, most cases I'm putting an interference screw into S1 just as a kind of a buttress. 
if you do a big hyperlordotic implant and things are really loose, uh, you might want to think about putting in, you know, at least two, if not three screws. Uh, when you close that from the back, even if you put screws in both vertebral bodies, the implant's going to shift the instantaneous axis of, uh, instantaneous axis of rotation forward. So it won't limit your ability to close the, the osteotomy in the back. Um, but definitely, um, you know, I have had some, some graphs that can migrate forward. So if I really do a hyperlordotic implant and it, um, you know, it's, it's pretty loose, you might want to put in extra screws to kind of prevent or mitigate that. If you do a spondy, um, if you basically still have a little bit of overhang of L5 on the graph, then typically I'll only fixate um, the uh, screw into L5 so that as I pull L5 back onto S1 with the screws, that it's not uh, limited by having screws in both vertebral bodies. We'll just put a screw into L5. And um, um, this is just an example, again, of us using those um, um, uh, lag screws into L5 and S1. It's really easy. Most of the time I put the screw to S1 just because it's straight up and down on the floor. They're really easy to put in. If, it's, if the disc space is really lordotic, it'd be a little bit challenging to put screws in L5. Dr. Holman got one question about uh, that wide annulotomy and discectomy. Do you have any technical pearls of how to get out uh, wide without getting into the vasculature or having any complications? Yeah, so um, the truth of the matter is that it's a piece of cake on the right side. Um, that's usually not a big issue. Uh, on the left-hand side, you know, sometimes the, the left vessels can be more of a problem. So actually, what I, I always keep my four pen field from the X-Lift set on my, my Mayo stand. So I'll use a peanut uh, to kind of try to get in that areolar plane, and that goes back to looking at the preoperative imaging to know if you have that little fat stripe or if there's more of a spondylotic um, you know, kind of osteophyte there might be more challenging. But I'll, I'll kind of use the peanut to kind of mobilize it. And then you can use the four pen field to get number one underneath the vein and then also underneath the sympathetic chain. So I use the, um, the four pen field a lot. And then uh, once I have it mobilized, then we'll use a, another type of a, a smaller um, kind of a, um, uh, a handheld retractor, kind of like your clowers that you would use in an ACDF. We've we bought some that are a little bit bigger, and then you can use those. Um, typically, my resident will be standing on the right-hand side, so when we're working subannular and really releasing that lateral disc, I always uh, tend to have a, a handheld retractor so that the curette comes out of the disc space and slips. It's not hitting the vessel. It's hitting, hitting metal. Any other burning questions? Okay, so... Um, Let's move on uh, to, again, a couple cases here. Um, this was a 54-year young female, again, with a, a history of multiple discectomies, now with recurrent disc herniation, uh, right leg pain, and um, you know, kind of worsening mechanical back pain, um, you know, exam, a little bit of uh, chronic weakness in the EHL. So you can see um, everything looks pretty good above 5.1. 5.1 is kyphotically degenerated. You can see that it looks like there's probably a recurrent herniation on the right-hand side. Um, I believe that we did get a contrasted study and there was uh, some non-enhancing material there. So you can see here are her, you know, lumbar x-rays. But we didn't, uh, we didn't just settle for that. I wanted to know, okay, um, best operation, you know, probably going to be doing an A-lift. Let's look at her sagittal balance. So you can see most everything here is green. Her lumbar lordosis is orange, so you can see that she's starting to get, you know, a little bit hypolordotic. Um, she actually has a little bit of thoracic hypokyphosis, but her C2 plumb line is over her hips. So again, not a big, you know, sagittal imbalance. So this is the type of case, I mean, we, we joked about it before, it's kind of the Tiger Woods operation, but someone that's had multiple discectomies, their scar tissue, if you go back and um, do something from the back, you're going to have um, a higher risk for a CSF leak. This is the perfect um, candidate for a standalone ALIF. And I mentioned how this is kind of like the ACDF of the lumbar spine. With that type of, you know, um, uh, PLL release and using those paddle distractors, you can get into the canal and pull a fragment from the front. So lots of people 
uh, do these types of surgeries uh, with the intention of taking out a fragment in the canal. Um, so again, when you kind of plan this case, um, standalone versus with screws, I mean, she doesn't have a spondy, she's pretty collapsed. You know, a lot of people say, hey, if the disc is more than 50% of where I think the normal height would be, that's a good indication for a standalone. And then obviously we have inner fixated cages or we have plates. So in her, you can see that uh, I put my lag screw in S1 and I put a plate and we kind of threw the kitchen sink at that one because I didn't want to be the, the black sheep of the family. But again, this was no doubt, do it from the front. Um, don't deal with the scar tissue from the back. Fixate it. You know, you could have done three screws and no plate. I think that would have worked fine. But again, I just went for a little bit more of a, of, um, you know, a kitchen sink mentality here. So, you know, this is great. Um, and you can see... Um, you know, her segmental lordosis. So we showed you the data. Here's proof, two degrees versus 14 degrees. So uh, a great improvement in segmental alignment. Now it's interesting, if you look at her global lordosis, it's, re it's really the same. So we really haven't changed the, the, the lumbar lordosis. So why might that be? So this goes back to that paper that I showed you about 10 times risk. Look at, you know, if you really didn't look at this preoperatively, um, L4-5 was starting to get hyperlordotic as a compensatory mechanism. So you can see just by doing that 5-1 graph how much the L4-5 disc is relaxed. So this is the reason why you want to drive the lordosis and you know, why ALIF is obviously the best option for this. Um, I don't think there's any question that with this type of reciprocal change, you're really reducing the burden uh, to maintain that lordosis from the four or five disc. Uh, you're taking pressure off the facet joints. I mean, these are the type of cases where you fuse someone flat and they have to continue to be hyperlordotic at four or five. The facets get overloaded and they, they develop a spondy and then you see them back two or three years later. And obviously you can see we get CT scan, solid fusion. And we talked about 5-1 being the king of um, surface area preparation. You know, you really don't have to, uh, to work around the dura. You've got a direct view of the end plates. You really can be meticulous about respecting the end plates. And you can see a uh, very nice fusion for her. Uh, this is just a, a different patient, but kind of the same pathology. So again, I wanted to show you, I mean, I, I just thought this was a fascinating slide. So same thing, same type of operation. Uh, this is a guy that I believe had had one previous surgery, but just look at that chain of reciprocal relaxation. Um, each level, the amount of segmental lordosis that was you know, there is a, a chronic compensatory phenomenon. I don't think there's any question. Now, if you get the lordosis with a T-lift, that's great. You'll probably see the same thing, but you better do a good job. And uh, again, if you look at TLIF, um, I think, you know, MIS TLIF is great because it's a minimally invasive operation, but most people that do that, they're not doing a bilateral facetectomy. And unless you're doing a bilateral facetectomy, releasing the disc on both sides, doing a very, very good job with respecting the end plates and getting a cage way up front, you're not going to get as much alert doses with a TLIF. Um, I really think that a, a well-done T-lift is probably the most technically demanding inner body operation that we do. And I'm not saying that X-lift and A-lift are not technically demanding. Every case is a little bit different. But at the end of the day, I mean, this is just a much easier, much more facile, um, you know, useful operation when you're dealing with 5-1. Um, so let's talk about some different pathology right quick. So this is, again, an everyday case. Um, this is something that walks into our office. These patients are a dime a dozen. So this was a pediatric cardiologist, 20 years, uh, history of back pain. He was an athlete. He had had an episode of radiculopathy and foot drop way back when that actually got better. Uh, but he came to see me because he was having recurrent symptoms for about a year and a half, and he was starting to get some radicular pain. You can see his exam. He still had some residual weakness from his previous foot drop, uh, some weakness in dorsiflexion. So here's his MRI scan. So you can see uh, grade one spondy, you have terrible foraminal stenosis. So you can see those L5 roots are really, really severely compressed. And here are his standing x-rays with flexion extension. <clears throat> I do think in flexion, it probably looks like it's sneaking up uh, close to a grade two. So a little bit of movement there. 
So again, we look at our global sagittal alignment. So you kind of look at those numbers on the left, um, what jumps out. Um, the red is thoracic kyphosis, so a little bit of hypokyphosis. If you look at that center of cranial mass without cal calculating anything, you can see it's front in front of the hips. So you know already that this patient is starting to develop a global sagittal problem. Uh, but again, if you look at, um, you know, PILL mismatch, 16 degrees, and for a pelvic incidence of 57, that's, you know, it's not in the red zone, but it's, it's uh, orange. So we're starting to get an unacceptable mismatch. Okay, so surgical plan, um, you know, again, this is an L5, A, L5S1 A lift talk. I think this is, you know, the go-to operation for me. I think really more of the decision-making here that's important is, um, do you do a decompression or not? And when you put your screws in, do you do them percutaneously or do you do the posterior approach open? So obviously, if you were going to do a decompression, you'd either have to do bilateral tubes and put perk screws in, which some people would do, or you would do an open operation to do a gill laminectomy, do a direct decompression, and then put in your perk screws. So um, Hussein, you've been in practice now, uh, what, three, four years? Uh, you're an orthopedic doctor. Um, classically, orthopedic uh, surgeons believe in indirect decompression. Are you going to decompress this person? He's got unilateral radic or are you going to rely on your indirect decompression? Uh, this all day for me is an L5-S1A lift uh, with percutaneous screws in the back. Um, I, I've, I, when I first got out, I was doing a few open ones, and I just started doing the perk ones, and they did just as well, and over, if not better, and recovered a lot faster. So this is A-lift and perk screws for me as well. Dr. Brindice, you, are the, you were probably the most facile orthopedic fellow to use a metrics tube that I've worked with. Um, so I know you love the tubes. Would you drop a tube on this and decompress the side that he had pain on, or would you just rely on your indirect decompression? I would rely on my indirect decompression. So it would be a L5-S1 A-lift with perk screws in the back. Great. Uh, Dr. Huang, you've spent a year in Miami. Are you going to do this from the front, or are you going to do something um, MIS or potentially endoscopic? Um, no, I think I think this would also be an L5 S1 A lift with uh, percutaneous uh, fixation. Excellent. Okay, so there's uh, my operative report, and here's the post-operative film. So again, um, I believe that this was a 20 degree cage. Um, so again, we saw that his center cranial mass was a little bit forward. His pelvic tilt wasn't that high, uh, but you know we wanted to drive the lordosis here and try to get him a little bit of extra segmental correction. So we did this with percutaneous screws. So you can see um, here is our um, post-operative x-ray. Now you can see that um, he's still a little bit in front of his hips, uh, but if you remember his, I think his pelvic tilt before surgery was 17 uh, or, or something along those lines. And you can also see that he's had a bit of a reciprocal increase in his thoracic kyphosis. Um, so again, um, I think um, still in my hands, this is the best option here. I think one of the things to know about the 5-1 ALIF is when you start looking at a pathologically increased pelvic tilt, um, if you start doing uh, hyperlordotics, ACR at L2, 3, L1, 2, T12, L1, uh, Greg Mundus taught me this. When you do those hyperlordotics higher up in the spine, you move the SVA, but you don't change the pelvic tilt. But when you do these 5-1 hyperlordotic A-lifts, this is the way that you correct pelvic tilt. So it's important to know that if you're simulating uh, and you're doing something higher up and you're really needing to change the pelvic tilt, if 5-1 is unfused, you have a great opportunity. If you have someone that's got a fusion down there and they have a high pelvic tilt, then you're going to need to think about a PSO at either L4 or L5 because that's really, you know, kind of where you want to drive the lordosis. Dr. Holman, can I ask real quick, did you, uh, did you release PLL on that, like the posterior analyst and the PLL in that case? I did, yeah. Any, any cage uh, that's, uh, you know, really for me 15 degrees or higher, um, I'm just doing that. I want to make sure that, um, you know, I get nice symmetric mobilization. So um, I, I pretty much routinely do that in every case. 
so you can see um, again the the difference um, you know pre op and post op and um, you know a little bit of improvement in in that global uh, sagittal alignment and again um, this is just you know if you start paying attention to these things look at what happened to l four five eight degrees he's had this lysis for many many years he's already compensating through l four uh, l four five and now you've taken that lordotic stress off that disc. So maybe the doctor is going to come back and he's going to need more work done in the future. But I think we've certainly, you know, mitigated some of the risk that he's going to be in that 10 times group. And you can see um, solid fusion. Uh, I'm, I'm a titanium guy, 100%. Um, there's a few cages like the coronally tapered X-lift that we're still waiting on our modulus counterparts. So that's kind of the, the peak. Um, uh, um, implant that I'm still using, but mostly titanium these days. I think that's the best option. So just, I think, you know, the, the five one a lift, we really need to talk about a Scully case because for me, you know, these are, are really, really helpful, um, uh, you know, approaches for the degenerative Scully population that I treat. So this is just, uh, again, a typical 73 year young female. Uh, she had had bad bone. We treated her with uh, Forte or Tim Lowe's for about a year. You can see big surgery needed, really, really bad bone for me, treating him for a year, and then I'm gonna bring him back. So she comes back a year later, um, and you can see here's her coronal um, AP um, scoliosis X-ray. So, you know, a pretty uh, moderate uh, to severe curve. Um, it's really important for the, for the residents, the young residents to understand one basic concept. So, you know, obviously this is a left-sided main uh, lumbar curve, but in most of these scoliosis cases, you're gonna see that there's a fractional curve. So what we mean by the fractional curve is what's happening from L4 to S1. So typically that curve is in the opposite direction. So in this particular case, if you do a really, really good job at fixing the, the scoliosis, which most people would assume we're talking about that main curve, she's already shifted um, towards the convexity. So if you fix the mid lumbar curve and you don't fix the fractional curve, you're gonna throw these patients further out of balance in the coronal plane. We know the coronal plane isn't quite as important, but there's some data that's been uh, presented to show that you know if you kind of uh, make that worse, uh, the patients, you know, can do a little bit worse clinically as well. So that's important to understand the difference between the main lumbar curve and the fractional curve. So you can see there's our C7 uh, coronal uh, plumb line already shifting towards the, the main curve. Okay, so in this lady, uh, we got nothing but red. So it doesn't matter what your pelvic incidence is. If your pelvic tilt's 45, that's a problem. So again, um, when we start looking at our correction, we're gonna fix that pelvic tilt to where we want it to be. So if you normalize the pelvic tilt, so that's right at the upper end of normal for her pelvic incidence. I mean, you can see this is a severe, severe sagittal imbalance problem. So again, CT scan, what am I, what am I looking for here? I wanna make sure uh, if I wanna do uh, particularly X lift, at the mid lumbar levels that you don't have any spontaneous fusion. And again, I'm looking for that intradiscal air at L45 and L5S1, uh, particularly at L5S1 where I, you know, I wanna do my A-lift. So you can see there's air in both, both of the disc spaces. Great, okay, so we'll just keep moving along since we're getting towards the end of our hour. This is, um, uh, again, preoperative planning. So uh, we know going into the OR kind of what we need to do to get our correction. Obviously there's no spontaneous fusion. so we want to get, in my opinion, you know, getting an inner body at all these levels, you know, creates that harmonious correction. We want to put the lordosis where it should be, which we know is at the bottom of the spine. So you can see here is our preoperative plan. And we use some patient specific instrumentation here to kind of plan this out ahead of time. You know, obviously Dr. Uribe talks a lot about this. Here are interstage scoli x-rays. So you can see that we've already kind of uh, brought that apex of the lumbar curve uh, back towards the midline. And then you can see, uh, obviously, um, after our stage two correction, so uh, with our um, multi-level Smith-Petersons in instrumentation, we get a you know, good result there. And then you can see here's our uh, sagittal correction. So 
and there's pre-op and post-op. She's actually a little bit more lordotic than we planned, um, but um, uh, no PJK, doing well. Um, and here's just her uh, post-operative parameters. So again, in this particular case, why did the 5-1 ALIF help us? So what we did in this case is we did push our graft towards the right-hand side of the disk space. So we got that fractional curve corrected by doing two things, asymmetrically placing our 5-1 graft. So we pushed that graft a little bit more towards the, the, the um, concavity of the fractional curve. And then obviously doing the, um, the four or five lateral with the Smith-Peterson. And so I um, almost always I'll put the either a wedding side to side domino or a double headed screw and then compress after we've done our Smith-Peterson's uh, on the um, convexity of the fractional curve. So that's a nice way to kind of neutralize that. Um, and then obviously do your in situ um, uh, correction and cantilevering to correct the, the main lumbar curve. But that's that's common strategy. So we we use the five one graft asymmetrically placed four or five la lateral Smith Peterson compress on the convexity and get that fractional curve neutralized. So we keep the patient and don't throw them more off uh, in in coronal imbalance. You know this talk is about the utility of five one. We know that we can use it for a variety of cases, and we know that sagittal alignment matters. No, you know regardless of the pathology. Um, this is a great approach, very reproducible. You got to have a good vascular surgeon. That's, that's really the key to all of this. The safety of the operation, you know, really lies in having a very extensive all exposure and someone that can get you there uh, quickly and efficiently. Um, and we know, again, this is, um, I think, uh, uh, Pete uh, threw this in here, and, and I love this saying as well. You know, there's the deformity surgeons there creating deformity and fixing it. And the reality is, is that, you know, we all need to be humble. All of us are going to have people that break down. But, you know, if that happens, you know, it shouldn't be because we got lazy and said, ah, eh, this is a degenerative case. I'm not going to get my Scully x-rays. I'm not going to check a DEXA scan. I'm not going to look at the pelvic incidents. You know, if we stay meticulous with our preoperative planning and we use these very powerful approaches to our advantage, you know, the, the first operation, you know, has to be a good one. Uh, so, we, you know, we don't want to have those 10x patients that are coming back uh, two or three years after the first operation. So hopefully I've showed you that, you know, uh, ALIF is, the, is the, uh, the bully on the block. It's the big brother. TLIF is a nice, cute operation, but it's really uh, not as, you know, facile. You can't do as much. And again, I, I'm not going to lie. I think um, doing a really, really good uh, T-lift at, particularly at L5-S1, I think that's a technically challenging operation. And if you really want to get a lordosis, you got to take out both facets. You got to do a lot of work releasing the disc. And uh, if you've got an excellent exposure surgeon and you use some of these technical pearls, I mean, this is really a, a pretty straightforward operation uh, that you can do in, you know, 35, 40 minutes. Well, thanks, Dr. Holman. Appreciate today's discussion on restoring lumbar lordosis at L5-S1. Thanks, everybody, for joining us and uh, wishing everybody a very good day tomorrow at the hospital. Thanks so much. Appreciate it, everyone. Thanks and a lot. everyone's getting back to work, and um, we're going to get past uh, this COVID situation and get back to what we all love to do, is that's to operate, help people out. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks Bye so much, guys. Dr. Holman. Thank you. Okay, good night.